Good morning, dear delegates. Could you kindly take your seats? So good morning to everybody. It's a great pleasure to see you. And we have the pleasure to see our chairperson, Mrs. Lale Ulker, who came from Istanbul or from Ankara. <laughs> and uh, she will pronounce her uh, opening speech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Director. Distinguished members of the World Heritage Committee, dear Director Rösner, members of the Secretariat and the advisory bodies, ICOMOS, IUCN, and ICROM, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to welcome you to the first session for committee members, fourth orientation session. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for the support you have extended to me for the chairmanship. I will spare no effort no, to fulfill this important responsibility you have entrusted me. Allow me to express my heartfelt congratulations to Madame Rösler on her appointment as director of the division for World Heritage and World Heritage Center. The SET division is very fortunate to have someone of her obvious abilities and academic background associated with world heritage. As you all know, it is now customary to organize several orientation sessions prior to the World Heritage Committee's annual session at the request of state parties. This practice allows more opportunities for exchanges and more time for preparation of the forthcoming session. Hence, another orientation session will be organized on 10th of July, immediately prior to the 40th session of the committee, which, as you all know, will be held in Istanbul from 10th to 20 July 2016. This orientation session notably dedicated to inform new committee members and jointly prepared by the World Heritage Center and the three advisory bodies will cover several topics and key notions in the framework of the implementation of the World Heritage Convention. Its aim is to assist the committee members in their preparation to the 40th session in the best possible conditions. Such sessions aim to contribute to objective decisions committee members will have to make and the processes they will have to follow or take into account as required by the convention, the operational guidelines and the rules of procedure. This session is organized mainly to familiarize ourselves with the relevant procedures, notions, and topics related to world heritage, including outstanding universal value, state of conservation, and nomination process. It will also cover specific matters and briefings. I'm convinced that this orientation session would be very helpful in our preparation of the work towards reaching the most appropriate solution concerning the issues that, will ha that we will have to address during the 40th session of the committee. Along the way, special emphasis should be given to the sustainability of the World Heritage Fund. As part of UNESCO's overall problems, the financial situation is on the top of the list. We all know that the sustainability of the fund is at stake unless effective and innovative solutions are introduced. This is the reason why our committee decided last year in Bonn to extend the mandate of the working group, the so-called ad hoc group, previously set up in Doha. The main aim in doing so was to allow further reflection on the recommendations on working methods 
of our committee and the sustainability of the fund. The ad hoc group convened three times since born. Based on the discussions, some preliminary ideas appear now on how to ensure the sustainability. The group, chaired by Turkish Ambassador, Ambassador Bosalı, will hold another meeting this afternoon. The Turkish chairmanship expects that tangible ideas emerge as a result of this exercise and aims to conclude the work of the ad hoc group prior to the 40th session so that our committee be able to decide without delay and in a fashion that will satisfy the expectations of the state parties. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, as you see, we have a number of important matters that will stand before us during the 40th session of the committee. The decisions we will take are expected to be objective and constructive with a view to ensure the protection of and preservation of world heritage in respect of international standards. Following its inception, the 1972 convention evolved into a highly visible and uh, prestigious establishment as one of uh, UNESCO's flagship instruments. It's attracting broad interest and recognition while raising the spirit of collective responsibility to protect, preserve, and manage the irreplaceable culture and natural properties of outstanding universal value. Our task is to protect the common heritage of humanity wherever it is located and regardless of whoever it may belong to. It is thus of paramount importance that we make sure that the credibility of our convention is preserved. In my capacity as chairperson, I shall be at your disposal for any critical issue which may come up prior or during the 40th session in order to have a constructive dialogue in the accomplishment of our work in Istanbul next July. Please be assured that you can count on my active assistance and full support. I'm also looking forward to see you, you at the information and exchange session at the end of May or beginning of June that we will have, during which we will provide you with more details on the 40th session of the committee and all logistical information necessary. Ladies and gentlemen, however, as you have no doubt noticed from today's program, a preliminary presentation about some of the logistical aspects of the 14th session will be had in a few hours at the end of our meeting. Concluding my remarks, I have full confidence that the 14th session in Istanbul will be a success with your active support, engagement, and contribution. The city of Istanbul, with its historical background that spans centuries and its multicultural structure, has a distinctive cultural identity. We believe it will be an ideal host to our session in terms of universal heritage as human value. On the way to Istanbul, we will be in close cooperation with you and other stakeholders and listen carefully to your views and comments. I thank you in advance for your efforts and I invite now the World Heritage Center and the advisory bodies to make their presentation. I give the floor to Director Ressler and I thank you all.
Dear Chairperson, distinguished members of the World Heritage Committee, colleagues from our advisory bodies, e-commerce, IUCN, and ECROM, ladies and gentlemen. For me, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this orientation session for the committee members, which is organized by the World Heritage Center in cooperation with the advisory bodies. But first and foremost, I would like to congratulate you, Mrs. Lale Ulker, as chairperson of the World Heritage Committee. It is one of the most important positions you can have among all of the international conventions. And I'm sure that with your background, you will guide us wisely and efficiently. I have no doubts. <laughs> we are very pleased that you came to chair this uh, orientation session. My intervention will be very brief, as uh, you as the chairperson, you have already addressed uh, this uh, session in more detail. But I would like to highlight the critical importance of this meeting. Ever since 2008, since the Quebec committee meeting, we organized this session, which proved to be very useful. At least many committee members have asked us uh, to do it, and uh, so we do now also one earlier in the year to be better prepared for the committee sessions <clears throat> and all the processes and procedures. This session is managed by the advisory bodies um, who are all here next to us, and presentations will be made both by the advisory bodies and my colleagues here from the center. And I would like very much you to participate in it, especially the new committee members. Please do not uh, hesitate to ask any question you always wanted to ask about World Heritage. The aim of this session is really to assist you uh, to efficiently prepare for the World Heritage Committee meeting. Um, I think it also assists in making the whole processes more transparent for all of those attending the committee meeting. In this regard, I would like to inform you that this session, and this is the first time, will be also recorded by video. In this way, it will be made available for the benefit of all committee members and of all state parties, and including the natural and cultural heritage experts from your countries that are unable to attend this session here in UNESCO. And I think this is very important that we will send the link out to the video afterwards so that you can share it with all your experts uh, in the countries. Finally, and as mentioned at earlier meetings, it is important for you to give feedback, so please let us know what you would like to have presented and discussed uh, during the next orientation session in order for us to be as relevant uh, as possible. And now I give the floor back to our chair and wish us all a very fruitful meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madame Rösner. Uh, now, we will, I think we will continue with Ecom. Yes, please. Uh, and Mr. King. Yes. Mr. King, you have the floor, representative of the Ecom. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And, and let me also add my congratulations and the congratulations of, of ECROM and my Director General, uh, Mr. Stefano De Caro, uh, uh, for your uh, assuming the, chair, the chairmanship of the World Heritage Committee. And I, I can just say that uh, we at ECROM look forward very much to working with Turkey and, um, and, and you, uh, under your direction as chair um, for the implementation of the 40th session uh, of the World Heritage uh, Committee. Um, and, and thank you again for, for giving me the floor. I will be discussing um, the concept of outstanding universal value, sort of introducing that concept. Um, but before I do, I just want to make a, a preliminary comment, uh, which we'll come back to later on in the agenda, and that is that um, these, uh, as the chairman, uh, as, excuse me, as the director of the World Heritage Center has already mentioned, these orientation sessions have been going on now since about 2008, and um, um, we've want to try to, we always try to make these as relevant as possible, and we wish to continue to make this more and more relevant as, as, as time goes on. And, and what we're starting to think about is we're starting to think about um, these orientations as a two-year cycle. Um, as new members are elected to the committee, um, there's a two-year cycle between that and the next uh, election of the, of, of, of the next group of committee members. And so what we're trying to think about a little bit for the future is, um, is putting these, rather than presenting the same information orientation session after orientation session, to think about this a little bit more uh, as a two-year cycle and looking at what kinds of information over the course of that two-year cycle might be interesting to, 
to all of you. Um, and so, um, and so, in fact, later on in, the, in this agenda, there will be a session on, or there will be a, a small uh, discussion on future orientation sessions when, when we'd like to actually hear back from you, g give you some ideas of what we're thinking, and, and hear back from you, from you uh, in that session later on. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that and to say that this introduction to outstanding universal value obviously comes at the beginning of one of these two-year cycles. We have we have uh, a number of new committee members coming on to the um, to the committee at this at, at this point in time, and so um, we uh, we think that it's important to begin at the beginning and begin at really what the basis of this convention is about, and that is um, outstanding outstanding universal value. So that's where we that's where we be, we begin our orientation in that in that sense. Um, I guess I have to ask for the next slide. Is that how we're working? Yes. Um, okay. Um, this is just my my opening. Sorry. Um, this is just my opening shot um, of uh, outstanding universal value, and what I've tried to do, I, I, I would hope that committee members will look up on this slide and see s uh, properties coming from your own, fr from your own countries in, in, in one, one way or another. I tried to incorporate uh, at least a picture of, of at least one property of outstanding universal value, in some cases cultural, in some cases natural, coming from each of the, each of the, the members of the, of the committee. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Sorry. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, when I begin a discussion of what is outstanding universal value, I often uh, start not with any definition in well, there is no definition in the convention itself, but but or the definitions in the in the operational guidelines. But I like to start with the title of the convention itself. Most of us, in a shorthand manner, refer to the World Heritage Convention as the World Heritage Convention. But the truth of the matter is uh, that that is not the title of this convention. The title of this convention is the uh, Convention Concerning the Protection of the World's Cultural and Natural Heritage. And I, I like to point that out because I like to underline, as, as you can see, I've underlined it in the slide, uh, the word protection. Um, this convention was, uh, was set up specifically to protect the world's cultural and natural heritage, and any understanding of outstanding universal value, I think, really has to be based on that concept of of, uh, of 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 protection. Now, within the convention, obviously, there are several different steps or or, or processes that are necessary uh, to um, uh, to carry out that protection. And those steps are identification, i.e., creation of the World Heritage List, but then protection, conservation. Um, uh, promotion uh, 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 and transmission to future uh, to, to uh, presentation rather and and transmission to future generations so so those are the processes that are necessary for protection but I think we need to understand that um, again when we begin to think about really what is outstanding universal value can I have the next uh, slide please uh, thank you um, now as I mentioned in the convention itself there is no specific definition of outstanding universal value, um, but uh, in, in fact, the framers of the of the of the convention were were wise enough to recognize that it would really be that the definitions of, of heritage were, were potentially going to change over time, and and how we view heritage were going to change over time. And so, what they did is they left uh, that to the committee. They said that it was going to be up to the committee uh, to determine and to define the criteria for inscription. Uh, of properties on the on on the on the World Heritage List, but in 2005 uh, we did add uh, to paragraph 49 of the uh, operational guidelines um, the definition that you see. I, I won't I won't take the time to read the entire uh, to read the definition, but um, but the key aspects behind this are in fact that this is heritage that is important and of common importance. Uh, for all of humanity, for for present generations of, hum of humankind, and for and for future generations of, of humankind, and therefore it is of the highest importance for the international community uh, to um, to try to aid uh, individual states parties in the protection of that uh, of that of that heritage. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you've seen this uh, you've seen this uh, picture also before, but. But again, it's it, it's worth mentioning that you know the concept behind this is a, a, a this is a drawing that was done by IUCN to try to explain the concept of of outstanding universal value, but in relation to all of the other values that 
properties have around the world. All countries have a variety of properties that, are, that have value at the subnational level, at the national level, at the regional level, and there are also uh, other conventions which may have value at, at, at different levels. The, the idea here, though, is that world heritage are those properties that are really uh, considered to be of outstanding universal value uh, for all of humanity. And, and by its nature, therefore, it's going to be a selected number of, of, of properties. It's going to be, the, the, the numbers of world heritage properties are going to be obviously much smaller than uh, the larger group of properties that may be important at an international level, uh, under other conventions, or at a regional level, or at a national level. So, so again, we're really looking at the most select properties uh, when we're talking about outstanding universal value. Uh, next slide, please. Now, here's our famous drawing that I know many of you are, are familiar with, um, but I think it's actually one that's very important uh, in talking about outstanding universal value. It's the committee that defines the criteria, or it, 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 according to the convention, it's the committee that defines the criteria for which uh, we consider outstanding universal value. And the committee has uh, made a very clear reference in the operational guidelines to what constitutes something of outstanding universal value. And it says that it must meet one or more of 10 criteria, but it also must, it also must uh, meet uh, the conditions of integrity for all properties that are to be considered of outstanding universal value, and it must meet the test of authenticity for those properties which are nominated under cultural criteria, that is the first six of the, of the 10 criteria. Um, and thirdly, and just as importantly, um, it must also have protection and, 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 and management. And, um, and I'll go back again to my comment about the title of the convention. This convention is about protection of cultural, of, of, of cultural and natural heritage. And as such, that pillar of protection and management is an important underpinning part of the, uh, of the outstanding universal value. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, and you can see, uh, and you've, many of you have seen this slide also before, what happens if one of those, if one of those three pillars is removed or is, uh, is sufficiently weakened, and in fact, the answer is that the outstanding universal value tumbles down, if I can, uh, if I can use that, uh, use that uh, expression. And I would again point out that in paragraph uh, 78 of the operational guidelines, it says actually very clearly that in order to be considered of outstanding universal, so, uh, universal value, the property in question must not only meet the, the specific criteria, but it also must uh, respond to the conditions of integrity and authenticity, and it must have a, uh, a system of management and protection to safeguard that property. So it, this is in the operational guidelines, and it's actually, uh, it's actually quite, you know, quite, quite clear that outstanding universal value depends not only on the 10 criteria, but it depends on the authenticity and integrity and the protection uh, and the protection and, 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 and management. Um, so I think these are important uh, aspects to, um, to take into consideration. Uh, next slide, please. So what are those, you know, what are those three pillars? Well, you know, the first, the first one, the criteria, actually respond to a question, why is this site important? And what you will find is that when, when, uh, when responding to those criteria, and again, I will not read, I, uh, I will not read the, the, the particular criteria. In this case, this is a, the, the picture is a, is a site from Finland. Um, but the point is, is that the, 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 the criteria, the, the paragraph itself, or the paragraphs outlining the criteria are going to explain to us and to explain to the world why is this particular property of, of, of importance. Next, next slide, please. And then the second pillar, which is the integrity and the authenticity, uh, is uh, going to be answering the question for integrity, is going to be answering the question, does it tell the whole story? Um, if we're making the argument that there are certain criteria which make this property important, that give this property a, a certain value, the next question is, does it actually tell the whole story? Is the site large enough? Does it contain all of the necessary elements for us to be able to tell this story, to be able for us to understand uh, why this site is important. And so the, 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 um, the issue of integrity is important for us to ensure that we have this, the, this uh, that we have the whole story, that we can understand the site in its, in its entirety and that it is considered whole or complete. Next slide. 
And then for the cultural sites, uh, the question becomes, um, is it truthful? Uh, are the, are the, the, uh, the attributes that, 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 that uh, explain uh, this value, this, this, this importance, um, are they actually truthful? Are they credible? And, and once again, that also needs to be a part of the, uh, needs, needs to be a part of our understanding of the outstanding universal value. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, uh, on the protection and management, uh, we are asking ourselves, uh, how can we assure the future of this, uh, of this property? And there may be a series of questions related to management, management systems, tourism management, um, and also, what are some of the key issues that we need to be looking at in the in 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 in, in the future on that? Uh, so those are the those are the pa the pillars that we need to be looking at. Uh, next slide, please. Now um, we've put that all together, and and this is something that, that that again in the 2005 operational guidelines, what we've said is that there needs to be a statement of outstanding universal value, which uh, combines all of these elements and which allows you, the committee, the state party, we, the advisory bodies, and the whole world to actually be able, through one statement, to try to understand what are the key issues, what, what is the key importance, and, uh, and, and the key protection aspects. And, and that statement of outstanding universal value, then, is first mentioned in, in paragraph 51 of the operational guidelines. Uh, next slide. Um, what is contained in that? Um, it's basically those things that I've just uh, that I've just explained to you. It starts out with a brief summary of the property, and that summary of the property includes uh, it basic factual information and also sort of a, a summary of what the key qualities are, the key attributes are, um, and then uh, that statement of OUV then explains criteria by criteria why that site is important, and then has paragraphs specifically related to the integrity of the property the authenticity of the property for those cultural sites, and uh, the information on the management and protection of the property uh, in order to maintain the outstanding universal value. Next slide, please. Um, so essentially, again, uh, why is this important to you as a committee? Why am I discussing this with you now in an orientation session? Well, the key reason is because all of the decisions that you make uh, are going to be based on this statement of outstanding universal value and, and, and understanding the statement of outstanding universal value because it is uh, the basis for the protection and management of the property once it's inscribed on the, on the World Heritage List. So that means that a state party needs to look at this statement of OUV even, uh, or at least start thinking about it even when they're doing their tentative list. But then you as uh, members of the committee are going to be have, having to look at this uh, when you look at the, at the nominations, when you, when you actually make your judgment based on the evaluations of the advisory bodies, you need to understand this outstanding universal value and, and essentially what you're doing is you're passing uh, your decision as to whether these standards of outstanding universal value have been met, uh, have been met uh, for the property. But you'll also be using this uh, for looking at um, uh, the reactive monitoring, the state of conservation reporting. You always, when we look at reactive monitoring, we need to go back and look at the statement of OUV, and we have to understand what the OUV is in relation to the issues related to monitoring, the issues related to periodic reporting, and then, of course, uh, it's something very important for understanding whether a site uh, needs to be inscribed on the World Heritage List in danger, and eventually whether a site would need to be actually removed from the World Heritage List. Uh, next slide, please. So again, uh, and this is just sort of a summary of, 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 of all that I've been saying. Um, uh, the, 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 the statement of OUV is important to all of us because it helps us to understand the reasons why, uh, you know, why a site is justified for being on the World Heritage List. Uh, it gives us the orientations that we need uh, in order to manage the site, uh, and it helps us to evaluate that site and the state of conservation of that site. Uh, for into, into the future. Uh, so this is, this is my last slide, but again, I just really want to emphasize that understanding the OUV of a property really underpins all of the processes of this World Heritage Convention. And so, uh, and so this really becomes the basis of our understanding uh, and it, the basis for you as committee members of, of, of all the things that you need to do and all of the decisions that you need to make as members of the committee over the next two to four years, uh, depending on your, on your mandates. So uh, with that, Madam Chair, I'd like to thank you for allowing me the floor and, uh, and thank you. Mr. King, thank you very much. It was a very comprehensive
briefing on concept of outstanding universal value. You have really enlightened us. Thank you very much again. Now I give the floor to talk on the nomination process to Mr. Alessandro Balsamo from the World Heritage Center. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I will uh, give you a, a, a real uh, brief uh, overview about the nomination process and the main uh, uh, nomination requirements uh, in the few minutes that I have, uh, knowing that uh, uh, especially concerning nomination requirements, uh, it is a, a presentation that sometimes I've been doing uh, during one whole week, so uh, it will be very summarized in this case. So the nomination process, uh, 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 next slide please, uh, start uh, uh, first of all with the state party making an inventory uh, of its own heritage, including both uh, uh, cultural and natural sites. Uh, one thing that is extremely important uh, to remind is that uh, uh, our convention is uh, the only international tool uh, providing a conservation for both uh, uh, cultural and natural sites. And after that, uh, 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 as you can see, uh, we um, inserted uh, uh, right away uh, the new concept of upstream process. Upstream process in relation to the nomination of site uh, for inscription uh, on the World Heritage List include advice, uh, consultation, and analysis that occur prior to the submission of a nomination and are aimed at reducing the number of nominations that experience significant problems during the evaluation process. The basic principle of uh, upstream process is to enable the advisory bodies and the secretariat to provide support directly to state parties throughout the whole process leading up to a possible World Heritage nomination. And the reason why uh, upstream process it is inserted here uh, at the very beginning uh, of the process is that for the upstream support to be uh, really effective, it should ideally be undertaken from the earliest stage in the nomination process, at the moment of the preparation or revision of the state party's tentative list. So after uh, making an inventory of its own heritage, uh, from the sites uh, on the uh, national inventory, the state party may uh, choose and select a part of them on those that he may consider that they uh, could have uh, outstanding universal value. And this is a process of selection that was also mentioned uh, just before by uh, Joe King, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, we should uh, uh, think about the convention as a, a tool that could conserve and preserve only a very selected number of sites. Next slide, please. So the state party uh, then may select one site from uh, his tentative list and uh, uh, choose it to nominate for inscription on the World Heritage List. Uh, of course, uh, this is a very summarized uh, uh, process, and uh, we uh, can see that uh, we jump to the already to the stage where the state party may uh, already submit a draft copy of uh, uh, this uh, nomination file uh, that normally should be done by the 30th of September prior to the uh, final, uh, finalized uh, uh, nomination submission. Uh, but we know that this step, uh, I mean, between uh, uh, the uh, first uh, uh, preparation of the nomination and the uh, uh, stage where the state party is already ready to submit a, a draft nomination may take, in, in, in many cases, some years. So uh, that's why here it's uh, uh, very summarized. Following the submission of a draft uh, nomination, uh, the Secretariat reviews the, the, this draft, uh, providing comments to the State Party in view of the finalization of the uh, document. Uh, and this is done during the month of October, November preceding uh, the final submission, which is, uh, next slide please, which happens uh, 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 by the 1st of February of each year, which is the uh, official deadline for submission of new nominations. Following this uh, uh, submission, uh, the Secretariat analyzes all the nominations received by the deadline and uh, check their completeness during the month of February. So right now we are 
uh, doing this work for the nomination that we received by uh, the last uh, 1st of February. And uh, uh, following the completeness check, uh, we uh, informed the state parties about the result of uh, this uh, completeness check by letter on the 1st of March. And then we transmit the, those nominations that are considered complete to the advisory bodies uh, during the uh, month of March. Next slide, please. Uh, from this point on, uh, we uh, consider that the evaluation process uh, is beginning and uh, uh, later uh, the advisory bodies will present uh, how this is dealt with. Uh, the first part of, of this uh, uh, evaluation process uh, between uh, uh, June and October uh, also include a, a mission on, on the site. Following this, so the advisory body had their first panel meetings uh, in which uh, the, we may, may decide uh, whether uh, supplementary information is needed or if uh, s some of the recommendations could be already elaborated. And this is in the month of December. And uh, uh, after that, uh, the advisory bodies forward to state parties by 31st of January of the second year, a short interim report outlining the status of any issues relevant to evaluations or, or any requests also uh, for supplementary information. And uh, this has happened for the first time uh, uh, this year uh, with the state parties nominating uh, properties for the, next, for the forthcoming uh, session of the committee. Next slide, please. So in case it is requested, the state party uh, should submit supplementary information by the uh, 28th of February of the second year. And following that, uh, the advisory bodies uh, have the second panel meetings in which uh, they decide the recommendation on the basis of uh, uh, the whole documentation uh, studied and uh, their discussion and the results of the uh, evaluation missions. Uh, this has happened uh, during the month of March of the second year, uh, and uh, uh, following that, uh, the, uh, the evaluation and recommendations are uh, basically finalized and transmitted uh, to the concerned state parties. As soon as we receive them from the uh, advisory bodies, uh, we uh, transmit them to uh, the concerned state parties, and which uh, happens normally uh, during the month of uh, May. Next slide, please. And uh, then uh, the state parties may, uh, uh, by looking uh, and uh, analyzing their evaluation, uh, uh, the evaluations of their uh, own sites, uh, uh, they may send letters detailing factual errors uh, uh, for which we have uh, uh, Annex in the operational guidelines, Annex 12. And this should be done at the latest by uh, uh, 14 days before uh, the opening of the session of the committee. Uh, at the end of the process, uh, it's uh, uh, up to the committee to take decisions, uh, uh, having uh, dealt with all this uh, information through uh, the reading of the evaluation and, uh, uh, of course, of the uh, related nomination file uh, by the uh, state parties. So the, 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 there are four types uh, uh, normally of um, decision that the committee could take. Uh, it's to inscribe, to refer, to defer uh, back to the third party or not to inscribe, but we will also see it, uh, later on what this means. And I will go now, next slide, uh, very quickly also on the main uh, requirements uh, uh, for uh, nomination, just to uh, remind you uh, really those main uh, requirements. Next slide. And first of all, uh, we have to note that, uh, of course, the site should be included on the state party's tentative list uh, prior to the submission of the nomination, but not only uh, included, but it should be at least one year prior uh, uh, in the tentative list, uh, one year prior to the submission of uh, uh, its related nomination. Next slide. Nomination, which is the uh, main uh, document uh, and the uh, basis on which the committee consider uh, the inscription of properties along with, uh, of course, uh, evaluation of the advisory bodies. 
and nomination in which uh, all relevant information about the site uh, which the state party wish to protect uh, uh, should uh, include uh, all uh, the, the, this relevant information. The uh, next slide, please. The structure of uh, nomination document, as you uh, all know, is uh, made of uh, uh, nine different sections plus uh, an executive summary. Uh, what is important to underline is that uh, uh, there must be a logic uh, line uh, which goes through the whole uh, nine sections and what is identified in section one should be described in section two and uh, justified in section three. This may seem obvious, but it's one of the main uh, uh, reasons for incompleteness of nominations which have discrepancies at this level. Next slide, please. And another uh, one very common problem uh, that may uh, encounter uh, nomination at the level of the completeness check is uh, uh, what concerns the identification of the site. Uh, again, uh, uh, what is presented in the identification session uh, must uh, also be matching uh, what is presented on the maps. Maps that uh, should have a, a series of characteristics to be uh, adequate and to present adequately the, the, the boundaries that are proposed. So uh, it should be an appropriate, appropriate typology depending of the, on the kind of uh, uh, site that is presented, uh, of course, for uh, uh, site in an uh, urbanized uh, 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 in a city or a city center, uh, we expect uh, cadastral maps uh, for a larger site, uh, maybe in a natural site we expect topographic maps, but uh, there should be a clear legend, there should be a coordination system, there should be clearly defined boundaries, and of course uh, it's very, very important also the scale that is chosen uh, uh, depending also on the size of the uh, site that is presented. The next slide, please. And uh, as you can see, uh, for instance, in uh, sites that are in uh, urban context, uh, it's also very, very important uh, uh, the width of the line uh, of the boundaries, uh, uh, which uh, uh, should be as thin as, as, as uh, to be visible uh, and uh, less uh, uh, think l less uh, big than, uh, for instance, a street or a building, because otherwise, uh, as you, we can see in next slide, uh, the, uh, this line could cover uh, an area uh, which makes the uh, boundary totally uh, inadequate and uh, hard to read because uh, it's not well defined. Another, uh, next slide, another very important aspect uh, and, uh, uh, on which often uh, a nomination may fail also at the level of the completeness check is the comparative analysis and uh, as uh, is uh, uh, required uh, in paragraph 132 uh, as well as uh, Annex 5 uh, uh, of the operational guidelines. Uh, the comparative analysis of the property should be done in relation to similar properties, which is really important, whether or not on the World Heritage List, and both at the international and national level. So uh, nomination files that do not include this kind of uh, uh, comparative analysis uh, uh, are incomplete. And uh, I must add also that a comparative analysis must include comparisons, because often the problem is that uh, under a comparative analysis, uh, we uh, receive a more description of a site. So it's uh, also problematic. Next slide. Uh, another very or important aspect, uh, uh, of course, uh, is uh, uh, the management, which should be uh, provided in the nomination uh, uh, along uh, with the rest uh, of the uh, information. And uh, next slide. Uh, another also very important part is the signature, uh, which obviously should uh, uh, conclude the, the nomination file, but uh, of course uh, uh, if that is missing uh, also it could be very problematic uh, in terms of uh, completeness. And with this I, I finish this part of uh, the presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair.
Thank you very much, Mr. Balsamo. Now we will continue with the representative of ECOMOS in the name of ECOMOS and IUCN. Oh, Ambassador of Finland, I, I think you have a question or a remark, please, sir. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson, and, and thank you. Uh, I missed your introductory uh, statement. Sorry about that. I'd like to thank you and the Secretary and the advisory bodies for the information we have received so far. And my colleague uh, informed me that actually it was uh, possible and w even welcome to ask a question when it's actually related to the presentation. So um, my able uh, colleague, uh, expert, would like to ask a question concerning the flowchart of the nomination process that was just presented. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, regarding the interim reports that we we saw in your presentation, uh, that was a recommendation made by uh, the ad hoc working group uh, working last year, and uh, it was discussed in the operational guidelines and uh, and actually uh, ended up in the operational guidelines by a decision in 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 Bonn last year. Uh, during the ad hoc uh, working group and also the operational guidelines working group, the text actually said that the interim report should be sent out to the secretariat, the chairperson, and in brackets it said to the committee members. That one uh, fell out actually uh, in the text in Annex 6 in the operational guidelines, the, the, the new version of the operational guidelines that we are working with now. Uh, however, uh, we, Finland as a committee member uh, all, the way, uh, all the time has thought that we as committee members need that information. So I would like to ask for a clarification on, on this point. Did we misunderstood something or, or what happened to the interim report that we have received the information about that it has been sent out to the secretariat and to the chairperson? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the advisory bodies, I think, reply, will reply this question. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. And uh, it's working. I think it's working. Well, so firstly, congratulations to the Chair and the new committee members. Just to respond to the question, in fact, it was foreseen to cover this in uh, a point about the evaluation process that I was going to address, but I'll address the point straight away. So first of all, we've implemented the um, interim report process and, and including for both IUCN and ICOMOS all of, for all of the state parties with a nomination where we had a specific request for supplementary information. Those letters were dispatched uh, before the end of December and right before the end of January for those where we didn't have specific questions but we had an update on the progress. Um, the information has been provided to the centre, and uh, it's foreseen, I think, after a meeting with the chairperson this morning, that the, the, those interim reports are available to the chairperson, as is specified. Um, I think it's probably a matter for the chairperson and the, and the centre to, to distribute further, but certainly from IUCN's point of view, um, we would see no reason why the committee members should not have sight of uh, a position of, uh, of IUCN on um, on the nomination that's been communicated uh, formally by us as part of the evaluation process. So uh, I think it's probably the, ch the office of the chairperson that can decide if that uh, request should be met, but we, uh, I don't see any objection to the committee having sight of that information. It would be normal that that could take place. Uh, I don't know if ICOMOS has any uh, opinion on the matter, but I, I think it's an on-the-record written position that could be uh, is intended to be helpful to all parties in the dialogue process. Mr. Badman, thank you for the clarification. I think there is no problem. We can do that. And representative of Portugal, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. Um, well, thank you very much for our um, Finnish colleague for his question, and, and thank you very much for IUCN on behalf of other advisory bodies to commit so strongly to, to requests made by committee members. But I, I wanted to use this um, very um, short window um, to first and foremost um, uh, congratulate you, Madam President, and um, 
thank you for being with us um, today. And of course, for us, it is also imperative um, to us today to share with you, Madam President, um, our profound sadness for the attacks yesterday in Ankara, um, uh, which we strongly condemn. Uh, we extend our deepest condolences um, to the families of those killed, and uh, we wish uh, a, weak, a quick uh, recovery for those injured. This is, uh, was my mess the message of my country to you, Madam President. Thank you very much for your very kind words of sympathy and uh, solidarity. Thanks a lot. Now I give the floor to Tunisia. Tunisia. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Merci aussi de cette initiative pour l'organisation de cette session d'orientation. J'ai une question par rapport au déroulement, donc par rapport à la réactivité avec la salle. Est-ce que les questions sont censées être posées après chaque intervention ou à la fin de toutes les interventions Et Sinon, par rapport à la présentation qui a été faite par le représentant du secrétariat, j'ai une question. Donc, euh, la Tunisie, elle a adhéré récemment, donc, au dernier, en novembre 2015, à la, au Comité du patrimoine mondial. Donc, j'ai un éclaircissement à demander euh, par rapport à la décision, donc, euh, suite à, à la fin d'un processus d'inscription. Si le, le bien n'est pas inscrit, il est renvoyé ou différé. différé donc, c'est quoi la différence et quel avenir pour un bien non inscrit Est-ce qu'il faut respecter une certaine période pour revenir à la charge ou il est de manière définitive non inscrit Voilà, c'était les éclaircissements que je, je souhaiterais avoir. Merci. Thank you very much. Uh, this will be replied and the further item. You, you will have the clarification and the further item. We have already asked a representative of Ecomos. You, you, you have finished already, Mr. Bell. Je vais vous présenter euh, brièvement les conditions d'inscription pour un bien sur la liste du patrimoine mondial. Voilà, je crois que je vais approcher le micro, ce sera mieux. Voilà. Donc je vais vous présenter brièvement les conditions d'inscription pour un bien sur la liste du patrimoine mondial. Donc, les organisations consultatives qui réalisent une étude scientifique des propositions d'inscription évaluent dans quelle mesure les biens qui sont proposés pour inscription remplissent les conditions de valeur universelle exceptionnelle, telles qu'elles sont définies par les orientations, et notamment en termes de critères d'inscription, en termes d'intégrité et d'authenticité, et de protection et gestion. La Convention du patrimoine mondial est une convention de sites donc ce sont bien des biens qui sont inscrits sur la liste du patrimoine mondial. Ces biens expriment une valeur universelle exceptionnelle et ce sont les attributs qui sont porteurs de cette valeur universelle exceptionnelle. Les attributs sont des éléments physiques et des aspects tangibles ou intangibles ou des processus du bien qui manifestent la valeur universelle exceptionnelle. Diapo suivante. L'inscription d'un bien sur la liste du patrimoine mondial est recommandée par les organisations consultatives lorsque les conditions suivantes sont remplies. L'analyse comparative a été considérée satisfaisante dans la mesure où elle a démontré la façon dont le bien se distingue par rapport à d'autres exemples similaires dans la même ère géoculturelle. Et elle a permis d'appréhender l'importance du bien dans son contexte national et international. 
les organisations consultatives s'appuient en complément des informations qui sont fournies dans le dossier de proposition d'instruction sur les recherches scientifiques et les études thématiques disponibles pour évaluer l'adéquation de l'analyse comparative. En ce qui concerne les critères, un ou plusieurs ou même l'ensemble des critères culturels et ou naturels qui sont proposés ont été justifiés. Les conditions d'intégrité ont été démontrées si tous les éléments qui sont nécessaires à l'expression de la valeur universelle exceptionnelle proposée ont été inclus dans les délimitations du bien, si celui-ci est d'une taille suffisante pour représenter les éléments et processus qui expriment cette valeur, et si finalement le bien n'a pas souffert d'impact négatif dû au développement ou à l'abandon. Un paysage agro-industriel, par exemple, devra inclure les éléments qui contribuent à dépeindre les principaux facteurs géographiques, technologiques et socio-historiques qui ont rendu possible son établissement et son développement. Pour les biens culturels uniquement, les conditions d'authenticité ont été remplies si les valeurs mises en avant sont exprimées de manière véridique et crédible à travers une variété d'attributs. L'ICOMOS vérifie dans quelle mesure les sources d'informations témoignent de façon véridique de la valeur du bien. Pour un site archéologique, par exemple, l'ICOMOS considérera comment les vestiges matériels du bien, associés aux nombreuses informations obtenues grâce aux recherches archéologiques conduites sur le site, ainsi qu'aux dépôts enfouis, apportent un témoignage crédible à l'appui de l'importance de la culture qui a bâti le bien. Diapo suivante. Les conditions suivantes doivent également être remplies pour justifier l'inscription. Les délimitations sont considérées satisfaisantes si elles incluent tous les éléments qui contribuent à la valeur universelle exceptionnelle du bien, si elles comprennent des zones qui, à la lumière de recherches futures, permettraient d'accroître sa compréhension, et si elles ont été clairement délimitées. Elles peuvent coïncider avec des zones protégées, et les zones tampons doivent assurer un surcroît de protection au bien. La protection est adéquate si le bien est protégé de façon réglementaire au niveau national, régional, municipal et ou traditionnel, et de préférence au plus haut niveau possible. L'ensemble du bien et ses attributs doivent faire l'objet d'une protection. Les mesures de protection doivent permettre de protéger le bien des menaces qui peuvent peser sur lui, et donc être mise en œuvre et jugée efficace sur le terrain. Les mesures de conservation mises en place sont satisfaisantes dans la mesure où elles permettent de maintenir les valeurs du bien ainsi que les conditions d'intégrité et d'authenticité. La gestion est considérée appropriée si elle s'appuie sur une compréhension claire de la valeur universelle exceptionnelle et de ses attributs, si elle définit la façon dont celle-ci sera préservée dans le futur, et si elle permet de gérer les changements de manière efficace et dans la mesure où elle s'appuie sur des moyens participatifs. Diapo suivante. Un bien peut échouer sur l'un ou l'autre de ses aspects. Il peut avoir une importance universelle, mais une protection et gestion qui ne sont pas satisfaisantes. A l'inverse, il peut être bien protégé et géré, mais ne pas avoir démontré une importance universelle exceptionnelle. La non-réalisation de certaines des conditions précisées précédemment doit conduire à proposer d'autres recommandations que l'inscription. Ce sont bien l'ensemble de ces conditions, telles qu'elles sont définies par les orientations, qui doivent être réunies afin de permettre l'inscription d'un bien sur la liste. Les organisations consultatives peuvent être amenées à faire des recommandations additionnelles, mais l'inscription n'est pas conditionnelle à leur réalisation. Ces recommandations sont perçues comme des orientations utiles pour la prise en compte de questions pour le futur du bien. Diapo suivante. Finalement, les organisations consultatives agissent dans l'intérêt de la conservation des biens. Cela signifie que parfois, il est recommandé que plus de temps soit accordé pour permettre l'inscription sur la liste. Je vous remercie. Yes, now, thank you very much. I would like to give the floor to Mr. Balsamo again.
to talk on the related documentation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, no, the, uh, the, sorry. Uh, don't know. Okay, Mr. Batman, you have the floor. Thank, thank you, Chair. Sorry, we uh, anticipated a presentation just to go a bit further on the advisory body evaluation process before the documentation. So if the slides would be returned to this, the, um, the first of those slides, please. Just while the slides are getting there, the, um, the, the last part of the presentation on evaluations uh, before we turn to the documentation is a short presentation from uh, me, me on behalf of IUCN with a short word from ICOMOS to follow uh, just to go a little bit further into the evaluation process that we engage in for nominations um, when we bring these uh, evaluations forward to the World Heritage Committee. So next slide, please. Um, sorry, next, thank you. Uh, so just firstly to reinforce that in all cases we have this common frame of reference uh, set by the operational guidelines for the concept of outstanding universal value. And so it is, as uh, Joe King from ICROM explained, uh, an evaluation of questions of criteria, questions of integrity for the natural sites that IUCN evaluates and questions of integrity and authenticity for the cultural sites that ICOMOS evaluates and also, crucially, the question of protection and management being appropriately in place. And the evaluation is seeking to determine whether all three of these requirements are being met by a nomination and to advise the committee if that is the case or not. Uh, next slide, please. So this um, slide just explains to you, and I won't read everything within it, but some of the principles that apply for IUCN and equally um, apply, uh, ICOMOS applies in terms of its, um, in terms of our approach to evaluations that we present to the World Heritage Committee. The first is a, a focus on quality and a focus on the role that we have to provide you with independent advice and it is the fact of the committee having access to independent advice that is one of the uh, foundations for um, maintaining the high standards of the convention. The second is an approach based on partnership, both with our fellow advisory bodies and with the World Heritage Center, in the case of IUCN also on a routine basis with the World Conservation Monitoring Center of UNEP, and uh, shown with the logos at the bottom of this slide for IUCN also with geological and geomorphological specialist organizations who complement uh, IUCN's main focus around uh, biodiversity conservation and protected areas. The third principle we consider is um, essential and is even more and more relevant uh, for this convention it, as it has more than a thousand sites and in the 21st century is the idea that with World Heritage Sites we should be seeking the highest quality of management of protection and to have sites that show the best examples we could imagine for conservation to be delivered in practice so we don't apologize for presenting to you evaluations where we seek to articulate the need for this convention, perhaps more than any other convention for heritage protection to set the highest possible standards. And the last uh, element of this is to make the note uh, that we extend um, in our evaluation across a wide ranging network of specialist advice, uh, as I've mentioned, IUGS and IAG, um, uh, and, our, and our own internal commissions, which for IUCN number more than 10,000 scientists uh, across the whole of the planet. Um, when we present an evaluation to you, and I think the figures would be quite similar for ICOMOS, um, we're presenting an evaluation that will have had uh, significant technical input from anywhere between uh, 20 and 40 
experts who've supported the process and given us um, inputs which we present to the World Heritage Committee. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a um, new diagram, as was referred to uh, by Finland in the earlier question. We have a updated and uprated process of evaluation that was agreed at the World Heritage Committee last year. So this is the um, annex in now in the operational guidelines that was completely revised um, with a substantial discussion on issues raised through the ad hoc working group. Um, and now makes clear uh, that we have a process which um, has a range of uh, inputs, as um, the next few slides will show you, always with a field component. So we always have um, experts going to the field to meet the state party, to meet stakeholders for every nomination, always with extensive desk review, um, always with uh, consultation with our partners uh, in the convention if if, they, uh, if we're dealing with any site where we have a common interest, notably with um, ICOMOS on questions of cultural landscapes and uh, mixed sites, and extensive consultation across our own regional um, and expert networks. Um, but this uprated diagram also makes clear that the uh, process has a range of different stages where dialogue with states parties can take place, um, sometimes before missions take place, always during field evaluation missions, and now always after the evaluation missions and during and after the meetings of the IUCN and ICOMOS World Heritage Panels. Um, as it was agreed late in the process, in fact, this diagram does not show the progress report um, component of the evaluation, but I think my earlier answer made clear that we now um, also, as required in the new operational guidelines, um, provide a progress report to states parties by 31st of January each year and on the basis of this year's practice for all those states parties where we are requesting additional information that was done uh, one month earlier than that to give even more time for the state parties to make those responses. Um, I think we can perhaps talk about the dialogue process if, if parties have questions but I, it is a, a hallmark I think of very significant change in the process that we have now very extensive discussion with nominating states parties across um, all, all of those parties that are making nominations. I think we're in contact with uh, all of them, at least by letter. We've offered meetings in every circumstance, and wherever meetings have been requested, we're holding meetings either by Skype or face-to-face. -face. Um, ICOMOS will add an additional point about their panel process um, uh, at the end of this presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just be very brief, um, as I think we've covered most of this. But this is a historic slide, the first time we've showed you a joint slide with pictures of the IUCN and ICOMOS World Heritage Panels meeting. Uh, these are no longer secret organizations. We've published de details of our panel membership for some time. ICOMOS uh, also does the same now, and uh, states parties have been invited to meet the ICOMOS panel this year. So enjoy this historic moment. Next slide, please. Um, the uh, next slide just makes the point that we go to the field, so you see here a variety of, inter uh, of uh, the field missions taking place um, across IUCN and ICOMOS. Uh, next slide, please. The, um, just the last slides make clear that uh, we have this dialogue process. This is actually about a state of conservation report with Australia, not a nomination, but we have many meetings that look uh, like this with states parties during the nomination process now um, comprehensively across uh, all nominating uh, states parties uh, that wish to meet us. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the last three slides just reinforce the point that we have a large amount of published um, science and advice available for states parties to benefit from. These are a range of the gap studies that have been prepared by IUCN and ICOMOS in recent years that are all available to help you uh, identify the strongest candidates for bringing forward to tentative lists and possible inscription within your within your countries. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the uh, last uh, slides here just illustrate the importance we attach as IUCN to building a diverse regional network of specialists across our regional offices to provide uh, more direct and regular support, including some staff that are now seconded to UNESCO Category 2 centers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 
the importance we attach to capacity building and training. Um, you, you may recognize a number of state party focal points amongst uh, this uh, training course for um, people on the IUCN uh, evaluation process. And the last slide, I think, um, is to just make the final point about the importance we attach to engagement with stakeholders in the process. Um, it is one vital part of the evaluation process that we um, access a full range of stakeholders, including communities, and the committee um, will be aware that in some uh, unusual but still present circumstances, some communities object and protest that states' parties are making nominations. Notably, we've had a range of complaints related to rights uh, of indigenous peoples that the, the committee has had to recognize, and it is an essential principle of the evaluation process that the transparency that is adopted uh, in relation to states parties is a transparency that we offer to all stakeholders um, so that uh, all, all parties in the, in the conservation of sites at ground level, which is ultimately where protection and conservation takes place, can participate in this important process. And we are most um, welcoming of the changes in the operational guidelines that were made last year to recognize uh, the rights and the, and the uh, UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, and the principle of free prior and informed consent in the um, nomination of sites uh, on the territories of Indigenous Peoples and subsequently the new policy on sustainable development which will give a, a large new phase in um, designing ways in which we can intervene on world heritage in ways that achieve protection at the heart of this convention but also support um, the aspirations of local communities within and outside World Heritage Sites. Madam Chair, with those words, uh, that concludes our presentations from the advisory bodies on the evaluation process. Um, with uh, just a short word, I think, from Mikamos, if you have the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Badman. I thank you, uh, the representatives of the advisory bodies for their in-depth presentation. Now, I would like to move quickly to Mr. Balsamo for his presentation on related documentation. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Very quickly, uh, this is an uh, important next slide, please. Uh, it's where to find uh, related documentation uh, on nominations uh, specifically, but not only. Uh, you will have uh, our uh, dedicated uh, uh, website uh, uh, where you have uh, different uh, uh, files, uh, parts of, uh, of the, this website uh, where you can find uh, uh, working documents. Next slide, please. Uh, the evaluation of the uh, uh, advisory bodies when uh, all of this uh, will be uh, ready, uh, will be put uh, online, but not only. Uh, next slide. You will uh, also have before then uh, uh, the nomination files uh, uh, as prepared by the uh, uh, nominating state party uh, for all the nominations uh, uh, that will be uh, examined by the committee at this 40 uh, session and this uh, uh, should be uh, ready and available already uh, in early April. Uh, we are uh, at the moment uh, including uh, the additional information that state parties are sending to uh, complete these nominations uh, and uh, uh, for which the deadline as you know is uh, 28th of February. So. Uh, we are still uh, working on that. Next slide. Uh, and uh, you will be able uh, then uh, to uh, look uh, at the uh, full uh, nomination, including uh, all the uh, annexes uh, uh, that are uh, submitted. Next slide. Uh, very quickly to go over about the, the role of the World Heritage Committee, uh, uh, specifically uh, talking about uh, uh, nominations. Uh, um, this is uh, basically uh, provided also in the operational guidelines uh, in paragraph uh, 23 and 24. Uh, paragraph 23, for instance, says that the committee decisions are based on objective and scientific consideration, and uh, such decision uh, depends upon, uh, among others, for instance, carefully prepared documentation, and this is why it's important also uh, to have uh, uh, this uh, document available on the web. Next slide. Uh, one of the main functions of the committee uh, is, uh, uh, as explained in paragraph 24, identify cultural and natural properties of outstanding universal values. So this is one of the main functions. Next slide, please. 
but uh, as we uh, were saying before, the committee may take uh, four types of uh, decision concerning nomination, and I hope this will also address the question asked by uh, the delegate of Tunisia. So this uh, four uh, uh, type of decision is to inscribe, and this is happen uh, as uh, was said before, when the committee find OUV, and this is fully established uh, with all of its uh, required uh, elements. Uh, it may refer, uh, 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 may decide to refer back uh, a nomination to the state parties when uh, as piece of additional information is needed and, and uh, with the deferral, with the referral, sorry, uh, there's no submission of a new nomination and no new visit to the site by the advisory bodies. And this happens uh, normally when, for instance, uh, uh, law uh, concerning the protection of the site uh, should be still adopted or uh, maybe a management plan finalized. Uh, the uh, committee may decide to defer uh, uh, a site, uh, a nomination, and this is for uh, uh, more in-depth assessment or study, uh, which requires a more substantial revision uh, by the state party through the submission of a new nomination and a new full evaluation uh, by the advisory body. In the end, the uh, last uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, decision that the committee may take is not to inscribe. And uh, if the committee decides that the property uh, should not be inscribed on the World Heritage List, uh, uh, the nomination may not be again uh, presented to the committee, except in exceptional circumstances. And these exceptional uh, circumstances may include the new discoveries, new scientific information about the property, or different criteria not presented in the original uh, nomination. In these cases, uh, in any case, a new nomination uh, will have to be submitted. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Bazamo. I think we can move to our next item immediately role of the World Heritage Committee. Mr. Mazama, you will continue? No, no, no. Uh, it's Mr. Bazan, and then here. Mr. Richard Bazan. Yeah. And then, yes. Mr. Richard Bazan. Mr. Dayan, you have the floor on state of conservation process. Thank you. Uh, merci, Madame la Présidente. Alors, comme on l'a vu, en, en présentant pour inscription sur la liste du patrimoine mondial un site de valeur universelle exceptionnelle, uh, l'État parti prend un engagement ferme envers la conservation de ce site pour l'ensemble de l'humanité et les générations futures. Uh, diapo suivant. Diapo suivant. Les articles 4 et 6 de la Convention du patrimoine mondial placent en effet le mandat de conservation au cœur même de celle-ci et soulignent le devoir de conserver ses biens et celui de la communauté internationale dans son ensemble. Diapo suivant. L'article 11.4 également de la Convention établit certaines dispositions relevant d'une obligation statutaire pour le comité de surveiller l'état de conservation des biens inscrits sur la liste en péril afin de garantir justement que leur valeur universelle et exceptionnelle est préservée. Sur cette base, les dispositions pour un suivi réactif de tous les biens ont évolué au fil des sessions du comité pour passer d'un système de suivi ad hoc et empirique au début des années 80 à un cadre bien défini présenté au chapitre 4 des orientations actuellement en vigueur. Diapo suivant. Alors, tout d'abord, le paragraphe 169 des orientations euh, définit le suivi réactif comme étant la soumission au comité du patrimoine mondial par le secrétariat et les organisations consultatives de rapports sur l'état de conservation des biens qui sont menacés. Ce processus est déclenché de manière ad hoc selon les menaces qui pèsent sur les biens. Ce paragraphe 169 précise également les dates auxquelles les États partis doivent soumettre leur rapport au secrétariat. Le paragraphe 172 des orientations, quant à lui, propose un cadre facilitant les discussions et l'envoi d'informations par les États partis 
en cas de projet d'aménagement susceptible d'avoir un impact sur la valeur universelle exceptionnelle du bien. Et dans le cas d'informations reçues de la part d'autres sources que l'État parti, conformément au paragraphe 174 des orientations, euh, ces informations sont donc communiquées par, ah, okay. par l'État parti euh, concerné, par le secrétariat, pour obtenir des précisions quant à la menace qui est rapportée. Tous ces paragraphes ont pour but de permettre un meilleur échange d'informations entre les États partis, le secrétariat et les organisations consultatives, et apporter un maximum d'informations objectives aux membres du comité. Diapo suivant. Le secrétariat et les organisations consultatives examinent ainsi toutes les informations dont ils disposent à l'égard de l'état de conservation des biens et rédigent de manière collégiale des rapports SOC pour examen et prise de décision par le comité à sa session annuelle. Diapo suivant. Enfin, afin de faciliter le travail du comité, votre travail, un format standard est utilisé depuis plusieurs années pour présenter toutes ces informations. Euh, chaque rapport SOC présente ainsi des informations de base sur le bien, un énoncé des problèmes de conservation actuellement rencontrés par le bien, une analyse objective de la situation et les conclusions du secrétariat et des organisations consultatives, et enfin un projet de décision pour adoption par le comité. Euh, avec votre permission, Madame la Présidente, mes collègues des organisations consultatives vont poursuivre euh, cette présentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayon. We, we may continue. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Euh, au nom des, cette présentation est faite au nom des trois organisations consultatives qui sont euh, engagées dans le suivi de l'état de conservation des biens du patrimoine mondial. Par l'inscription sur la liste du patrimoine mondial, les États partis s'engagent à protéger, conserver, gérer et assurer le suivi des biens afin de pérenniser leur valeur universelle exceptionnelle. Les organisations consultatives s'engagent dans chacune des activités que déploie le suivi réactif à mettre à la disposition du Comité du patrimoine mondial et des États partis un conseil d'ordre scientifique et technique sur des problèmes de conservation pour la prise de décision du Comité. Les rapports de suivi de l'état de conservation préparés pour le Comité portent sur un nombre très limité de biens, 141 en 2015. Ces rapports se basent sur les informations fournies par des États partis et d'autres sources qui ont, auront été préalablement vérifiées. L'analyse objective de la nature et des sources des problèmes de conservation débouche sur des propositions de solutions techniques appropriées. Le rapport, les rapports de suivi de l'état de conservation des biens sont élaborés en collaboration avec le Centre du patrimoine mondial. Ce travail conjoint doit garantir que le contenu des rapports répond bien aux exigences techniques et administratives attendues par le comité. Dans chacune des organisations consultatives, une équipe de spécialistes prépare des projets de rapports. Ils connaissent bien les biens et ont une expérience des problèmes auxquels ces derniers sont confrontés. Dans certains cas, les organisations consultatives peuvent faire appel à d'autres spécialistes, membres de leur réseau, qui pourront apporter une connaissance sur des aspects très spécifiques de la conservation pour compléter ce travail. Les facteurs qui influent sur la valeur universelle exceptionnelle, transmise par des attributs physiques, des processus et parfois des associations, sont multiples. Ils couvrent un large éventail qui va de la dégradation matérielle aux ouvrages à grande échelle, à l'utilisation des ressources biologiques, en passant entre autres par la gestion. Ainsi, les rapports préparés pour chaque session du comité proposent, en plus des rapports relatifs à la sélection de biens, une synthèse des problèmes de conservation émergents et récurrents. Ces rapports sont présentés conjointement avec le Centre du patrimoine mondial au comité à l'occasion de sa session annuelle. Il s'agit de présentations très courtes qui ouvrent les discussions du comité. 
Les organisations consultatives peuvent alors être appelées à répondre aux questions techniques des membres du comité. Nous avons noté que le processus de suivi réactif doit être le plus proactif possible. Il doit également disposer des outils les plus pointus, tout comme de la méthodologie la plus claire pour évaluer l'impact des menaces sur la valeur universelle exceptionnelle et ses attributs. Il doit être mis en œuvre dès que possible afin de minimiser les impacts sur les biens. Pour ce faire, des outils sont mis à la disposition des États partis, notamment sous la forme de publications. Ainsi, ces dernières années, des progrès ont été accomplis dans ce domaine avec les déclarations rétrospectives de valeur universelle exceptionnelle, la coproduction avec le Centre du patrimoine mondial des manuels de référence sur la gestion, la gestion des risques de catastrophe, ou bien les orientations de l'UICN et de l'ICOMOS pour l'établissement des études d'impact. La stratégie pour le renforcement des capacités, avec plus particulièrement ses cours pour praticiens, rejoint ces dispositifs. Le processus de suivi réactif prédispose à un dialogue positif et constructif avec les États partis autour de problèmes réels. Cet engagement auprès des États partis prend place notamment au cours des missions de suivi réactif et de conseils demandés par le Comité du patrimoine mondial. Ces missions visent à soutenir les États partis dans leur travail pour atteindre les objectifs définis par le Comité du patrimoine mondial. Les échanges entre les États partis, le Centre du patrimoine mondial et les organisations consultatives peuvent également prendre la forme de réunions de travail qui sont organisées notamment autour des sessions du comité. Les études techniques réalisées par les organisations consultatives sur la base des documents en réponse au paragraphe 172 des orientations et les missions de conseil demandées par les États partis en amont pour étudier des projets spécifiques sont autant de manières d'engager un dialogue avec les États partis. Néanmoins, il nous faudrait discuter plus avant comment le mécanisme du paragraphe 172 pourrait devenir plus utile et plus viable. Nous avons également besoin de plus d'opportunités pour explorer l'état de conservation de biens qui sont menacés par une érosion graduelle de leurs attributs dans le temps. Il nous faut, dans le même temps, souligner les limitations en termes de ressources pour développer un engagement plus proactif avec les États partis. Pour conclure, les organisations consultatives souhaiteraient souligner que le processus de suivi devrait reporter l'attention de toutes les parties prenantes sur la meilleure manière d'utiliser l'expérience partagée et la coopération internationale pour résoudre les problèmes de conservation. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Madame Bourdin, for very in-depth uh, presentation. I use uh, Mr. Batman. Will you have another presentation, or it was the joint? You will have. Okay, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. I was asked to just say a few words on the list of World Heritage in danger uh, as part of this orientation. So, if we move to the next slide, please. Um, so, the list of World Heritage in danger is the second list of the World Heritage Committee maintains. Um, it given the title of the convention focused on protection, one could say it will become perhaps the most important focus of the committee um, as it signals the sites which require urgent action where they are threatened. Um, and currently 48 sites, uh, so nearly 5% of the World Heritage List are included on the list of World Heritage in Danger, 30 cultural sites and 18 natural sites. Uh, and these are discussed under item 7A of the committee's agenda. Next slide, please. The um, key points just to take from these uh, five slides are firstly that it, it's a call for action and it includes uh, the following components. So the committee should pay attention when sites are listed as in danger to firstly the, the measures that are needed to correct the situation and secondly the timeline um, wherein those measures might be acted upon. And if we can move to the next slide, please. For every um, site, the goal is now to have a desired state of conservation set for the removal 
of a site from the list of uh, from the list in danger. This is a, a cooperative um, definition of the uh, the, the uh, level of recovery that is needed by a site to be removed from the danger list, um, produced uh, by the World Heritage Centre, the advisory bodies, and the state party that has its site listed in collaboration and adopted formally by the World Heritage Committee. So this provides, the goal here is to provide a clear indication of what um, the state should be of recovery for a site to be removed from the danger list. Uh, next slide, please. Um, next slide. There we go. So this is just uh, lastly to note the um, the, the, the fact that we wish to reinforce that the danger list, uh, as it is conceived, is a central element of the World Heritage Convention. It is not foreseen and was never foreseen as a punishment um, or a criticism of states parties. It is an instrument to promote conservation action for threatened sites. And we've seen as one uh, very good example, uh, the park, the National Park of Los Catillos uh, in Colombia, which was listed in 2009 at the request of the State Party of Colombia for a range of reasons uh, that are listed on the slide here. A desired state of conservation for removal of this site was set in 2012 with indicators related to both existing and potential threats. And the last slide, please. Um, this shows um, just, uh, in very, uh, just a very few words how, in this instance, Colombia was able to work with the committee to use the fact of danger listing to raise political awareness of the issues, to raise funding to be channeled to address in the threats to the properties, and to secure both international and greater national uh, support for actions that were needed to restore its management. And this was uh, then a, a site where we could uh, see that the committee was able to remove it from the list in danger, uh, with a recommendation made uh, by IUCN that that should happen at the committee last year. So it's the latest in uh, some of the good examples of seeing the danger list as a conservation tool and perhaps the most important conservation tool the committee has to really address uh, the sites that are most threatened on the World Heritage List. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Badman, for your very interesting presentation. I think Representative of Poland uh, would like to have the floor. You have the floor, Madam. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I would like to congratulate you on your nomination. Uh, you can count on our support uh, in your endeavor. Um, our expert from the Capitol would like to, uh, to uh, has a question before beginning. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure whether it's the right point uh, to ask a question or not, uh, but we would appreciate very much if it would be possible for the center and advisory bodies to uh, to give us a list of state of conservation reports as soon as they are agreed to be prepared for the committee session. Just a list of names of the sites which are going to be uh, reported for the committee session so we can use the time and get prepared uh, just just before the all the documents are, are issued. So if it's not uh, a big burden and it's possible that we, we would appreciate very much. Thank you. Madam Rosta, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is not a problem, so we can send this to the committee members. We are about to finalize it, but I uh, just one word of caution. There may be some emergencies. Uh, <laughs> these can happen, but uh, the list is about to be finalized. Thank you very much. Donc, euh, dans le cadre du suivi réactif et pour une prise de décision objective et informée, il vous sera donc nécessaire d'examiner conjointement euh, un certain nombre de documents, euh, les rapports soumis par les États parties ou un résumé, bien sûr, euh, les rapports de mission, le cas échéant, euh, les décisions précédemment adoptées par le comité afin d'assurer un suivi euh, cohérent de, des décisions adoptées, 
et bien sûr les rapports SOC euh, rédigés par le secrétariat et les organisations consultatives. Euh, diapo suivante. Donc tous ces documents se trouveront sur le site internet du Centre du patrimoine mondial à l'adresse indiquée en haut de l'écran. Euh, sachez que les rapports du secrétariat et des organisations consultatives sont rendus publics six semaines avant le début de la session du comité, afin de vous permettre justement un examen approfondi des questions soulevées. Diapo suivante. Enfin, euh, le Centre du patrimoine mondial propose depuis quelques années à présent, un système d'information en ligne et public sur l'état de conservation des biens, où vous pourrez trouver toutes les informations précédemment citées, ainsi que l'ensemble des près de 3200 rapports SOC présentés au comité depuis 1979. Vous y trouverez également les guides et manuels et euh, notes d'orientation indiquées par ma collègue Lily Comos dans sa présentation. Euh, diapo suivant. Alors, afin d'introduire ce point sur euh, votre rôle en matière de suivi d'état de conservation, euh, je ne pouvais trouver meilleure citation qu'un paragraphe issu des orientations de 1977, à l'origine même de la Convention, et qui disait, je cite, « Les responsabilités du Comité du patrimoine mondial sont immenses, mais il n'est pas de défi plus important à relever, il n'est pas de tâche qui ne mérite autant d'être entreprise que l'action menée au nom des peuples du monde afin d'aider les États à protéger pour les générations futures les biens tant culturels que naturels ayant une valeur universelle exceptionnelle. Diapo suivante. Donc pour ce faire, vous devrez adopter une décision euh, sur chaque état de conservation qui vous sera présenté, euh, conformément au paragraphe 176 des orientations. Euh, vous pourrez ainsi décider, par exemple, qu'aucune action euh, ultérieure naîtrant, ne devrait être entreprise. Euh, si le bien ne s'est pas détérioré ou s'il n'est plus menacé, ou que l'État parti doit prendre les mesures nécessaires afin d'atténuer les menaces dans un laps de temps raisonnable, ou bien que l'État parti tienne le secrétariat informé de la mise en œuvre de mesures nécessaires par le biais d'un nouveau rapport, si besoin est, selon un calendrier bien défini. Enfin, vous pourrez également demander qu'une mission d'experts soit envoyée sur le site afin qu'une décision mieux informée soit adoptée. Diapo suivant. Enfin, comme la UCN l'a expliqué un peu plus tôt dans sa présentation, euh, lorsque les conditions l'exigent, vous pourrez décider d'inscrire un bien sur la liste en péril ou de l'y maintenir si son état de conservation ne s'est pas suffisamment amélioré. A euh, l'inverse, si l'état de conservation du bien s'est amélioré de manière telle que sa valeur universelle exceptionnelle n'est plus menacée, vous pourrez alors décider de retirer ce bien de la liste du patrimoine mondial en péril, comme on vous a présenté le cas de Los Catios en Colombie. En dernier recours, euh, en cas de détérioration évidente du bien au point où il a irréversiblement perdu euh, les caractéristiques ayant justifié son inscription, vous pourrez décider de retirer ce bien de la liste du patrimoine mondial. Diapo suivant. En conclusion, euh, pour assurer votre rôle de la manière la plus efficace que possible, euh, vous devrez être en parfaite méprise, maîtrise des dispositions de la Convention et des orientations ainsi que des explications statutaires et budgétaires de chacune des décisions que vous adopterez. Par ailleurs, vous pouvez rester assuré que toutes les analyses faites pour votre compte de la part du secrétariat et des organisations consultatives euh, sont faites de manière approfondie et avec toute la compétence et l'expertise nécessaire pour faciliter votre travail. Nous nous tenons bien entendu à votre disposition pour toute information complémentaire. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Mr. Veillon. Uh, Republic of Korea is asking for the floor. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, congratulations for your chairmanship. We are certain that uh, with uh, your leadership, uh, this year's committee will be successful. But secondly, uh, I would like to thank you for Secretariat and uh, all advisory bodies. So this uh, orientation is very useful. So my question is about uh, the progress report or its uh, implementation report, uh, reviewing uh, the past decisions of a committee. There are many cases of progress report or implementation report request to the state party, which has many recommendations or requests to, to submit uh, uh, at a certain time to the committee. 
I have two questions uh, in, in, uh, on this subject. And the first one, that progress report is categorized as a set of conservation report or other items. So which are uh, agenda items in the committee to dealing with uh, the examination of a progress report? The second question uh, that you know, the, the committee examine uh, the progress report. So before the committee examine the report, are there any role or, or responsibility of secretariat or advisory bodies to check the, the how the progress report by the certain state party fully accommodate the request or recommendation decided by the committee? Thank you. Director Rushlider, did you respond to your question? You have the floor, madam. Thank you very much, and also thank you for the question uh, raised by the Republic uh, of Korea concerning progress reports. In each of the decisions the committee takes on a state of conservation, um, uh, you can see this in the reports of the committee, it's very specific if they ask for a full state of conservation report or a progress report or whatever it is. So it depends on each of the cases. And I believe as we are here under the item state of conservation, you raised the question in terms of progress reports uh, on state of conservation. Now, um, we have established also um, a new procedure um, with reports which were due now on the 1st of December. So which means that the Secretariat has looked as, at these reports, and if he felt that something was missing, we would also get back to states' parties. Um, but um, to tell you from the practice <laughs> is that uh, only when we write the State of Conservation reports together with our advisory bodies, we may detect some of the issues which were not fully covered, but this we discuss in the document which we present to the World Heritage Committee. But we had tried to establish, similar to the process on the nominations, further dialogue with state parties, and I think this, uh, we see some quite good outcomes on that. I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Madam Roshna, thank you very much for the explanation. And yes, Poland would like to take the floor. You have the floor, Madam. Thank you, uh, dear uh, Chair, Madam. I would like to ask whether uh, I think ECOMOS uh, state parties are receiving technical review of the state party state of conservation report. And I would like uh, to ask about the status of the reports. Are they are going to be reported to the committee at some point uh, where we are in the system with, uh, with this uh, reviews, how we should treat them and sh how should we uh, reported them to, to uh, um, stakeholders and site managers. Am I, am I clear? Um, there are different types of reports because some of the reports may have been requested by the World Heritage Committee um, and not for being reported back to the World Heritage Committee, but for technical reviews. This concerns also, for example, in a, in a case when the committee requests a management plan to be submitted by that and that date, it doesn't necessarily go back to the World Heritage Committee. But it could go back if the technical review by the advisory bodies um, says this is not fully in compliance, etc., and there may be a reason why we could bring it back. Um, maybe the advisory bodies, or Peter, you want to comment also? Well, I, the, the question raised by the representative of uh, Poland uh, refers to the technical reviews the advisory bodies uh, produce with reference to paragraph 1 and 72 of the uh, uh, operational guidelines. These are technical reviews that are based on documentation that is produced by the state parties uh, and that are reviewed by specialists within the advisory bodies. So these technical reviews are transmitted to the World Heritage Center for 
distribution to, to the third party concerned. And as the, the director of the World Heritage Center, this is a, a, a process by which uh, we establish a um, consultation with the third parties regarding specific technical issues at World Heritage properties. And in some cases, uh, few of them come to the committee uh, level because uh, there are certain uh, questions that the committee should uh, be involved with and take decisions uh, regarding technical aspects. Thank you, Director Verste and Madame Borden for your explanations. Uh, I think we have concluded our section dealing with state of conservation. So we can move to the fourth section of our agenda which is on procedural matters. Uh, and I would like to invite Madame Petia Tocharella to speak, to have make a presentation on the rules of procedure as well as conduct of the World Heritage Committee session. You have the follow floor, Madame. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, actually, this is a topic, procedural matter, is a topic that we addressed in more depth uh, during the orientation session that will take place in uh, Istanbul uh, on the 10th of July, uh, just prior to the starting of, uh, of the 40th session of the committee. Uh, at, at this point of time, uh, we just want to flag a couple of issues uh, and provide some information, answer questions if you have uh, any, any inquiries on those matters. Next slide, please. Uh, basically, uh, what we wanted to, to, to share with you and to insist once, uh, once again is what are the documents uh, that you have to be fully aware of and uh, to have a very, very good um, knowledge of them uh, in order to do your work in the most efficient way uh, during the committee session. These are, of course, the World Heritage Convention or the Convention Concerning the Protection of the World Natural and Cultural Heritage, as it was uh, highlighted uh, by ICROM, which is the official title, uh, the operational guidelines, the rules of procedure of the committee. And while we don't say that this has to be a midnight table reading from here to the committee, it's really important that um, all the delegations and uh, the technical experts are well aware of the, um, of the, of the provisions and of, of all those documents. Where you can find them, um, they are available. There are copies available here, some printed copies for you. Uh, but basically, you could find those on the website of uh, the World Heritage Center. And uh, you see the little arrows uh, which show the convention text, the operational guidelines, the committee. Let me just remind that the operational guidelines were revised in a rather substantial <coughs> manner at the 39th session in Bonn uh, last year. So uh, the version which is the valid one is the 2015 version of, uh, of the operational guidelines. Same with the rules of procedure. There have been some uh, minor uh, amendments, adjustments of the rules of procedure. So this is also the version of 2015. Then uh, we also, on, on, that, um, on that matter, I just wanted to tell you that in order to facilitate uh, your work and dealing with quite substantial documents and uh, heavy, heavy documents, especially the operational guidelines, uh, the World Heritage Center is uh, going to put all those documents together in a booklet of basic texts of the convention, which will include the operational guidelines, the rules of procedure, the convention, also the rules of procedure of the General Assembly and some other important documents. So you would be able to have just um, one manual or one, one book in front of you instead of uh, looking at different documents. And uh, we shall duly let you know when, when this is ready. 
Next slide, please. Um, as far as the organization of the 40th session is concerned, uh, we shall, of course, hear the presentation of the host country now, but it's important to know from that all the important details will be included in the general information document, which you will receive with the invitation letters for the, for the session, and uh, we expect that will happen around the end of, uh, end of March, beginning of uh, April. The information in this document would mostly be provided by the State Party, and I'm sure they're going to address it. Further information will be provided concerning the session, uh, will be provided during the information and exchange session, which we have planned for end of May, beginning of June 2016 at UNESCO headquarters, and uh, where we shall be able to get much more details uh, from the host country. As to, the, as to the session itself, for those that uh, have already been members for the last uh, two years, they're well aware of the very heavy, very tight agenda of, um, uh, of the committee meeting, and they know that they would not have a lot of time free. Uh, they would be busy since the morning until the evening with working groups at um, lunchtime quite, quite often, uh, with side events also at lunchtime and in the evening. So that, that, that's going to be prepare yourself for, uh, for a rather intensive uh, work. Of course, you know, the day start with a bureau session in the morning. So we have the World Heritage uh, uh, Committee Bureau, which consists of the chair, the rapporteur, and five vice, uh, vice chairs. Uh, we have plenary sessions for the timetable uh, that will be um, sent to you with the invitation letters starting at 9.30 until 1. Then we shall probably have at lunchtime meetings of the so-called consultative bodies, budget, uh, with the operational guidelines, depending on the issues that are coming. And uh, meanwhile, prepare yourselves also for, um, uh, for a number of interesting side events. Um, if we, if we go to the um, next slide, if we go to the next slide, you will see, uh, you see a snapshot of, a, uh, of uh, the page of the 40th session uh, at the, of the World Heritage uh, site, and you see where you can find the documents for the session. Of course, we shall send further information where you'd be able to find the documents, but the, the, the main information that is there is the description of the session and uh, all other um, logistical issues and also documents. For the time being, uh, the documents are in preparation and um, you will receive them according to, uh, to the schedule which is established uh, six weeks before, uh, six weeks before the, the, the committee session. Next slide. Now, concerning the rules of procedure, as I mentioned in the beginning, and I think this is uh, what I'm going to end, uh, end with, uh, those would be discussed really in, uh, in more detail in, presence, in the presence of uh, a representative of legal affairs during the orientation session on the 10th of July. Uh, and many of the issues that are um, mentioned on the slide uh, will be discussed in further detail and uh, you have, of course, the possibility to ask, uh, to ask questions and request more detailed information. All of them are important, and they're important for the chairperson, for the, for the committee, for the bureau. It's the order of speaking, time limit for interventions, the duties of the chair and the rapporteur, the conduct of business, quorum, voting, and so on and so forth. We do believe that it would be very useful if you have any, any questions before the session or from here until the, um, until the committee, the secretariat is ready to respond to any questions you may have. And if there are any legal issues or legal questions, of course, we can consult LA. Uh, here we have, uh, if we go to the next slide, I think this is, uh, this is uh, uh, just a, a memory of the orientation session uh, which we had just prior to the 37th session in Phnom Penh, 
And this is uh, what is going to happen on the 10th of July from 3 to 5.30, if I'm not wrong. So these are the several elements that uh, we wanted to, um, to brief you on uh, really briefly. Uh, if you have any questions, we can respond uh, further or uh, as, as the time goes and as we approach the session. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Tocharawa. I think Burkina, representative of Burkina Faso is asking for the floor. You have the floor, Madam. Merci, Madam la Presidente. Uh, je voudrais tout d'abord également vous féliciter pour votre désignation, pour la présidence de notre comité et vous souhaiter et plein succès et durant nos travaux. En tant que nouveau membre du comité, et nous avons suivi avec intérêt toutes les informations qui ont été communiquées. Et à ce titre, je voulais juste revenir sur un point, et parce que nouveau membre, je ne sais pas comment ça fonctionne. C'est concernant l'interaction entre les membres, les experts du comité. Est-ce qu'une fois que les documents sont communiqués, Avant la session, est-ce qu'il y a une interaction et, entre les membres du comité avec les organisations consultatives ou c'est uniquement et, au moment de la session que les, les échanges se font Et c'est ma première question. Et ma deuxième question, c'est plus euh, concernant les propositions d'inscription sur les sites. Et ça concerne surtout les, les, les sites naturels. Il peut arriver que le site naturel traverse deux ou trois États. En ce moment, comment se fait la gestion de, de, du, du dossier d'inscription? Est-ce qu'un seul État peut prendre l'initiative de préparer le dossier avec le secrétariat, le monter, sachant qu'il y a d'autres États qui sont impliqués, ou bien il faut une préparation collective pour euh, soumettre le dossier jusqu'au au, au terme du processus? Et voilà mes préoccupations pour le moment. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Directeur Rochla will respond to your question, Madame. Madame Rochla, you have the floor. Thank you very much uh, for your question. You can have a continuous interaction with the advisory bodies. We encourage very much through the whole process of thinking ahead that we have uh, a dialogue between the advisory bodies, uh, the committee member, all states parties, and the World Heritage Center. So uh, that is always possible if you have specific questions. But there are these occasions like this one, the orientation session, the information session, the next orientation session, where you can uh, ask specific questions on processes. If there are questions on specific dossiers, uh, you would need to contact also the specific advisory body, and uh, I will also ask them if they have uh, maybe another answer to give. Concerning um, transnational um, nominations, and I actually know very well what you are referring to because I have been working in that specific site in 1996, and I was just back to Burkina Faso uh, for the new year. Um, this is a site which, is, which concerns three countries. It was nominated first by one country, and that is Niger, and the site was inscribed by the committee. Um, it's actually a very interesting example for many other state parties. Um, it was inscribed by the committee against the advice of IUCN, which wanted to have the other two states parties joining the proposal. But the committee took the decision to inscribe that part on its own uh, against the advice from the advisory bodies. However, the committee made the encouragement for the other two countries to prepare the nomination, and I think this is what is happening. Mm -hmm. So um, there are different processes uh, and procedures, but uh, the best way to go is, of course, to work from the beginning jointly with the other countries to prepare joint management to address the challenges together, etc. Maybe the advisory bodies would like to add something on that? Mr. Bedford, you have the floor. Thank you. I, 
I think the answer on the transboundary sites is, is Paul, and the, uh, perhaps there's a precision just that there's, when a, when a transboundary, in general, when a, a site is nominated by more than one state party, all the state's parties must support the nomination, but it's taken on the quota of one, uh, one of the nominating state's parties, and the parties can decide between themselves who that party should be. Um, but just to turn to the first question, uh, so we are um, open for any support which any committee member um, may wish to request from us at any time. Um, we are not here based in Paris. IUCN is based uh, three hours away on the TGV uh, near Geneva. Um, you're all welcome, um, as are any states parties to the convention, to visit us there. Uh, we're frequently here in Paris. And if there is anything we can do to answer any questions at any time, uh, interact with your nature experts uh, at any time, please don't hesitate to request that. Um, the more discussion and interaction there is in preparation for the committee, the better. And uh, there's no real uh, obstacles to that discussion taking place in what, whatever way would be helpful to you. So please don't hesitate to uh, request that if it would be helpful to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Badran. So I think we can move to our next section, which is on future session of the orientation session. I think representative of ICROM, Mr. King, uh, will present this item. Thank you, Mr. King. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I won't spend a, a long time on this, but um, I think it's, u it's useful for, uh, for me to just give you a few considerations uh, in relation to the orientation sessions. Um, and as I mentioned at the, at, at the beginning, uh, before I started talking about OUV, to, to try to look at these in a, um, let's say, in a more uh, integrated or, um, uh, well, let's use the word in integ integrated way, over a, period of, uh, over a period of, I would say, two years. Why, why do I say two years? because every two years there are elections in the General Assembly of States parties for new committee members. So there's a turnover at that point in time. Obviously, it's not a turnover of the entire committee, but it's a turnover of uh, a certain percentage, uh, certain percentage of the committee. But clearly what that means is that, um, uh, that as new members come in, then there's a need to go back and repeat information uh, for those new members or to, to, to give new information to those members as, as we're trying to do as we're trying to do here, but it may not be necessary for that same information to be uh, conveyed uh, in subsequent orientation sessions. So this is a discussion that, uh, that we've been having, ECROM's been having with uh, the other advisory bodies and the World Heritage Center uh, to try to think a little bit about how we organize these sessions over the course of a two-year cycle. Um, in general, uh, just for information, there are, there are generally per year approximately three moments when there can be some sort of an orientation or information uh, exchange uh, at, at this kind of a level like we're having now. And those, those three times per year are one session in January or February, which is what we're having actually right now. Oftentimes that is attached to the advisory body, uh, advisory body meetings. That isn't, that isn't the case this year, but oftentimes it is related to the, to the, to the meetings that we, that we have with the World Heritage Center in January. So that's the first occasion wh where we can do it. The second occasion, as has already been mentioned a number of times by the Secretariat, is the information meetings um, that will take place usually in May, sometimes beginning of June. I don't know exactly what the dates are going to be this year, but there's that information meeting which also takes place here in Paris. And the third occasion is just before the committee meeting uh, in the venue of the, of the committee. So in this case, for this year, it will be in Istanbul uh, just before the committee session starts. Uh, so those are the three occasions in a year where these kinds of orientation sessions uh, can take place. Um, the other two things for consideration by the committee are um, where are committee members at a particular point in time? Why do I say that? Well, this session here in Paris is very useful uh, and specifically for delegations uh, that are here based in Paris. I know that in some cases there are people sitting here who are coming from experts from, from capitals or from, you know, from, from coming from the country specifically for these sessions. But certainly that's also very difficult for at least some committee members um, to be sending their, um, their experts, let's say, to a session in Paris, which is only going to take place for a half a day. So that's one question also that we have to think about is where are the people who would benefit from these orientation sessions. 
And that's something for us to keep in mind. And then the third issue to keep in mind also is who else might benefit from these. So obviously committee members will benefit from, from these. And committee members especially will benefit from procedural issues as have has just been presented by the World Heritage Center and issues that when we get to them in, in July in terms of speaking order and making amendments and things like that are benefits you know, clearly to the committee, but we also have to think about whether there are other states' parties that might benefit on some issues. So these are things that I would ask uh, committee members to keep in mind as we think about how we want to organize these orientation sessions for the future. So in the short moment, um, what I wanted to, uh, to just talk about is, is at least for this first cycle of three for this year, uh, how, we're, how we're thinking about things. Obviously, we're coming to the end of this session. So in this session, we've uh, done some basic uh, information, again, outlining what is outstanding universal value and the processes for nominations, the requirements for nominations, and state of conservation, and then a few of the procedural matters. Um, so that we've had, we've covered in this uh, in this particular session. Um, in there will be a there will be an information session, as has already been brought out on a, a, a several occasions already today. There will be an information session toward the end of May or the beginning of June. And during that session, as the Secretariat has already pointed out, there will certainly be a, um, let's call it an uh, organizational and preparational issues for the 40th session of the, of the committee. So there'll be much more information specifically related to how the 40th session will be, will be organized. Uh, will be organized. Um, there was also some discussion. One of the questions that has been raised by committee members in the past is they would like to also maybe have br a, brief, a brief briefing on the budget situation in relation to the um, in relation to the community, and that also there might be a possibility for some sort of a brief, uh, a brief briefing. Excuse me, that's a bad way of saying it, but a brief briefing uh, in relation to in relation to budget issues at that information meeting. And then we were thinking also that it would be useful to uh, at that moment uh, cover a couple of what I would call content-related issues. And the, and and again, in terms of requests from committee members in the past, one of the issues that has come up is uh, the issue of gap analysis and balance of the list. And so we were thinking that might be an interesting uh, an interesting short presentation to make. The work that the advisory bodies are making on the gap analysis and and specifically on the balance of the list. And as we are entering into a reflection year for periodic reporting. Uh, th that is, we've now finished the second cycle and we have to go into a reflection year. That also might be something that, that would be useful to talk about at that, uh, at that moment. So that would be for the information meeting. And then we get to the July meeting and the, inf the orientation session for the July meeting. And it, to be honest, in, in that respect, my idea was to actually divide this into two, uh, t into sort of two, let's say. Um, clearly, all committee members uh, for the July session will need to have information in relation to the venue itself and procedures, so things like speaking and voting and how do you make amendments and those sorts of things. And I think that's something that actually bears repeating every year because committee members will be coming and will be needing to speak and will be needing to make amendments and will be needing to, uh, to, to, will be needing to vote. So I think that's something that's always going to be uh, going to be useful. I think also in years where an operational guidelines have been changed, as is the case last year, it would also be useful for there to be a short presentation on those changes and how it might actually affect uh, decision making. Um, and, and again, maybe also a short briefing on the, on, on the budget. But then the idea would be to also talk a little bit more about content and content related issues. And actually, Burkina Faso raised this issue of serial sites. I, one of the questions I know that is often being raised, not in specifically for, for, for your one site, but in general is how do serial sites work and what are the, what are the issues related both to their nomination but also related to, this, to the state of conservation once they're, once they're on the World Heritage List. How, how, do, how does that work when there are issues that come up for state of conservation? So uh, the idea would be maybe uh, to have a, a, a brief presentation on that issue of serial sites. Um, and one of the other requests that the committee has been making in the past is the possibility that maybe some committee members might be able to, uh, in relation to some of the topics that we talk about, maybe make a presentation. So in that case, maybe it would be useful to find a committee member uh, who has an interesting issue related to serial sites or who has had an interesting experience related to serial sites who might be able to make a, a, a presentation also at that, at that moment. So that would be the first part of that session, and that would be for all committee members uh, in the first instance. But then what we were thinking was maybe taking a short break and coming back after the break to allow for a second 
part of that session which would actually then go back and repeat some of the things that we've already been doing here because there may be members of your delegation who are not here today but who do need to have uh, or would be useful for them to have uh, a repetition of the presentation on what is outstanding universal value and a repetition of uh, some of the issues related to the nominations and the, uh, and the state of conservation. So that wouldn't be, for those of you who don't want to sit through something that you've already sat through, at, you know, there could be a break and, and people go, could go away, but then for those people who are interested in specifically hearing uh, that, sort of second, that sort of second phase and going over some of the things that we've already gone over, there would be a possibility actually to have that. We're not talking about long sessions, but, um, but this, this is at least one way to try to make sure that we tailor the sessions to the needs of the, uh, the committee members and, and, again, where they may be at any, at any particular time. These are just some ideas, and what I actually would like to propose is I would like to propose to open a dialogue with you, the committee members, on how you would like to proceed with these in the future. These are the ideas that we have, and, uh, you know, you can, I, I would say we can have a discussion here if you would like, or you can contact the from uh, outside of the, the um, outside of this particular meeting so that we can actually try to develop uh, a much more constructive and useful or set of orientation sessions that are going to be useful to you as committee members in your decision making because that's really why you know that's really why we're here is to make things useful for for, for you the committee members and help you in in your decision making processes so that's where i would where i would stop now and 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 again uh, ask if there are any questions or or any comments that might be might be useful at this point thank you madam chair thank you very much mr king i don't we don't have any questions, so we can move to the last item of our agenda today. There will be a brief presentation by the host country on the logistical arrangements of the forthcoming 48th session of World Heritage Committee. Before giving my, uh, the floor to my colleague, Mr. Cem Kahiolu, I would like to just point out that Immediately following the Bonn session of the committee uh, in Turkey, a task force, an inst interinstitutional task force is uh, established uh, for the preparation of the forthcoming session of our committee. Uh, this task force is working in close cooperation with World Heritage Center I would like to take this opportunity to thank the members of the World Heritage Center uh, for their cooperation. And Mr. Cem Kahioğlu, a member of the Foreign Service of our um, country, is the coordinator of this task force for the preparation of the forthcoming session. I give the floor to Mr. Cem Kahioğlu for his Thank you, Chair. Hello. So my name is Cem Kahiol. I'm the head of departments for cultural diplomacy at the Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So you will see my contact information on the screen in a few minutes. So before we proceed, please be advised that my presentation is only a preliminary one on some of the logistical aspects of the 40th session. You will find ample information in the information document that you will receive uh, with the invitation letter. Moreover, as our chairmanship, chair, I'm sorry, chairperson announced, uh, during the information and exchange session to be held in either early June or late May, we will provide you with all logistical information. Let's move on, please. So Turkey ratified, ratified the convention on 1983. This is the second time we are member of the committee since our first term between 1983 and 1989. Turkey has 15 cultural and natural properties inscribed on the list. As you see on the screen, they are spread all over the territory. The sites inscribed represent several layers of Anatolian civilizations and include Hellenistic, Roman, Byzantine, Armenian, Seljuk, and Ottoman masterpieces of art and history. Next, next slide, please. Turkey will be hosting the World Heritage Committee session for the first time. We have chosen Istanbul as the host city 
the cities experienced on in organizing major international events of big scale, such as UN, NATO, and OEC summits. Following the decision of the committee last year, we set up an interagency body. Now you are seeing the logos of the different stakeholders. Minister of Foreign Affairs is naturally the leading institution along with the Minister of Culture and Tourism. You have the National Commission just in the middle, along with the Istanbul Greater Municipality and the site management for Istanbul's historic peninsula. And we have also the Turkish Airlines as partner, a company which by every measure is recognized as one of the best airlines in the world. Next slide, please. You already know your chairperson, Ambassador Lali Uker. Next, please. You have my name and my contact details. Don't hesitate to contact for any inquiry. Next, please. Now we see the draft timetable of the 40th session. The registration in person will start in the afternoon, the day before the opening. It means 9 of July. As usual, side events can be organized before and after the formal sitting of the committee and during the lunch break as well. Next slide, please. Here you see the very simple plan of Istanbul. You see the historical peninsula that is inscribed on the World Heritage List since 1985. Up above the venue of the session and also the hotels area are indicated. Please note that Istanbul has two international airports. The first one is the Atatürk Airport that you see at the left of the plan. The second one is called Sabiha Gökçen and is located at the Asian side of the city. Because of the flight frequency, the most practical way to come down to Istanbul is to fly to Atatürk Airport. However, should participants prefer a flight to the second airport for financial reasons, because from time to time, fares to Sabiha Gökçen may be discounted. So there are regular shuttles from there to Taksim area, where both the Congress Center and an important number of good hotels are situated. Before arriving to Istanbul, maybe we can develop on the visa cluster. In 131 of 190 state parties other than, other than Turkey, there's Turkish Embassy. Nevertheless, for delegates requiring a visa to enter Turkey, regardless of whether Turkey is represented in their country or not, we will establish visa facilitation, if not a total exemption. Details of such system will be discussed first internally in Turkey and then communicated to state parties, most probably with the information documents. Next slide, please. So as you see, the venue of the 40th session, the main hotel and other options for accommodation are located almost side by side within a very short walking distance. Next, please. The Istanbul Congress Center is one of the newest and most modern multi-purpose complexes of Istanbul. It spans a surface of 120,000 square meters on a total of five floors. Next, please. The center can host a wide range of events from Congress and phase to exhibitions. It has also an outdoor area overlooking, overlooking the Bosphorus, where we are planning to organize the opening event. Next, please. Next, again. The auditorium of the center is the biggest meeting hall with a capacity of 3,555 persons. This hall is currently one of the options available in our hands for the plenary session, but we, are, we have uh, different options as well within the same Congress Center. Move on, please. Again. 
So at the Congress Center, there are multi-purpose meeting halls, foyer, event areas, and workshop rooms, varying in capacities and sizes between 17 and 168 square meters. The total number of halls and rooms reserved to side events is 64. Please, next slide. Next again. Next again. 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 Yes. So here is a brief presentation of services that will be given at the meeting venue. So the high speed Wi Fi connection, chatting services, banking and exchange services, bilateral meeting rooms, delegates' lounge, post office, first aid, souvenir shop, and so on. There was some information and tour the desks or offices. Next, please. The main accommodation center will be Hilton, Hotel Hilton, which is the first ever Hilton outside US. It is opened in 1955. It was also the first modern hotel in Europe built from the ground up in the aftermath of uh, World War II, but it is renovated since then. So participants who will be staying at Hilton will have easy access to the venue of the meeting since each one lies adjacent to another. The last day for the reservation is the 10th of June. For Hilton and other hotels, uh, participants will have special rates. Next slide, please. So in Istanbul, the number of hotels with certification from the Ministry of Culture and Tourism is 705. The total bed capacity exceeds 140,000. Uh, 171 hotels uh, have four stars, while the number of five-star hotels is 123. So as a result, participants will have a multitude of choice. For instance, within a distance of one kilometer from the meeting venue, there are 23 hotels of four and five stars. Move on, please. So here are some keywords that will allow you to find hotels that are close to the meeting center. Attention, those are not the names of hotels, but only the names of the areas which are close to or surrounding the Istanbul Congress Center. So you have Beyoğlu, which is the main Para Avenue or Boulevard. You have Taksim, which is one of the most major places of Istanbul, or square of Istanbul. And you have Shishane, Tarimane, and Tarlabaşı. These are all names of the neighborhoods of areas surrounding the Istanbul Congress Center. But in any case, in the information document that you will receive along with the invitation letter, you will be given a single reservation link where you, find, where you will find all categories of hotels with discounted rates. Next slide, please. So Istanbul is a huge mega city with some 15 million inhabitants. Although the traffic is often unpredictable, it is congested. However, during the time we will have our session, the city will be less crowded. In addition to the subway system, city bus, sea bus and ferry, tram and taxi are frequently used in Istanbul. The taxi is not expensive. Anyhow, each and every participant will be delivered free of charge, a special pass called Istanbul card. It can be used in every means of transport except taxi. There will also be enough ring services between the taxi hotel area and the meeting venue for physically challenged persons. Next slide, please. So no need to talk or to describe Istanbul to you. Neolithic artifacts uncovered recently, recently indicate that Istanbul was settled as far back as the 7th millennium before Christ. It is a transcontinental city, transcontinental city between Europe and what Roman Empire called the Asia Minor. We can move on. Istanbul was the capital of three empires, namely Eastern Roman, Byzantine, and 
Ottoman. The city is crowned by monumental masterpieces from Byzantine and Ottoman periods, such as the legendary Hagia Sophia and the Blue Mosque. And all participants will be provided with free access to state museums in Istanbul during the length of the session. It may be in form of a card, a special card, or by showing simply the committee badge at the entrance of each museum. Next, please. Next again, please. And the youth forum will be held in Istanbul and Bursa between 29 June and 12 July. The invitation letters were sent on 16 February by the Turkish National Commission to UNESCO to their counterparts in member states of the committee. And finally, please, email addresses regarding all aspects of the session are shown on the screen. So you have for the general information info at 4OWHC2016.Istanbul. For registration, you have registration, the rest is the same. Accommodation, accommodation, side events, side events, and youth forum, YF, the extension is always the same. 4OWHC2016.Istanbul. And as I told you before, you can, you can also contact me for all, in, all the information you will need. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Jem, for your presentation. We have already concluded all the items of our agenda, but of course the floor is open for the questions of the member countries as well as the state parties, if you have any. Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan. You have, the you have the floor, Ambassador. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I would like to congratulate you on your election uh, to, the, to the post of the chairperson of this committee. Uh, I'm confident that with the, under your able chairmanship and uh, with the traditional Turkish hospitality, the session of this committee will be a successful one. Uh, as a new members of the committee, Azerbaijan is looking forward to work with you, Madam Chair, with, uh, with the Secretariat, with the advisory bodies, and with other members of the committee for successful implementation of the uh, World Heritage uh, Convention. Uh, using this opportunity, I would like to thank Secretariat, advisory body, and the host uh, country, Turkey, for this uh, information session, which is indeed very useful for us, uh, especially for new members. Uh, we really are eager to work uh, in, uh, in this committee with full support of uh, other members of the committee. And uh, last but not least, uh, Madam um, uh, Ambassador, I would like to, to add my voice and to express our deepest condolences and solidarity with the Turkey and the Turkish people on these uh, terrible acts of terror happened in Ankara yesterday, which claimed uh, many innocent lives. Our praise with you. Thank you very much. Ambassador, thank you very much, first of all, uh, for your very kind words and your strong support and confidence to the Turkish chairmanship for the World Heritage Committee. Uh, also, I thank you and I thank again to the representative of Portugal for their mm, words of sympathy and condolences for this vicious terrorist attack that took place in Ankara. Uh, the solidarity among all states and parties are quite important for our fight against terrorism. And we all know that no country, no city is immune of these vicious terrorist attacks taking place all over the world. So um, thank you again for your words of uh, sympathy. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador.
and I don't see any. So before closing, formally closing our uh, orientation session, uh, I would like to take this opportunity, first of all, to thank our secretariat, the members of the World Heritage Center, as well as the members of the three advisory bodies for their very comprehensive thorough presentations on different aspects, very crucial aspects of our convention as well as on the work of the committee. It was very enlightening for me. I'm sure it was the same case for our new members. Uh, of course, uh, we will have another briefing session at the end of May or beginning of June, and uh, the second orientation session will take place just immediately before prior to our committee meeting. So in the meantime, I'm sure the secretariat as well as the representatives of the advisory bodies are very open. Any question or remark or any request for clarification coming from the member countries as well as the state parties. I really would like to express my gratitude, Madame Rösner, uh, for this orientation session. Uh, and uh, I'm formally closing the orientation session, but uh, Director Rösner, she has a surprise for you. That's why I give the floor to Director Röster. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you also on behalf of the whole team and the advisory bodies for your kind words. It's a pleasure for us to organize these sessions. But as the chairperson said, we have a little surprise because we would like to present to you the publication World Heritage in Europe Today. Uh, on this day, this was, is a fantastic publication which was prepared by Petya Tocharova, um, who was the chief of Europe and North America um, uh, from 2010 to 2015. And this publication was written by uh, Christopher Young, Katri Lisitsin, and Pierre Gallon. Uh, these were three experts which were involved in the analysis of the results of the second cycle of periodic reporting in Europe along with Anatol, um, Anatol is in the room somewhere, he's waving from the World Heritage Center. Now this is a new and quite innovative format for World Heritage publications on periodic reporting, um, which uses the outcome of uh, this exercise to connect, uh, to connect with a much broader audience. Because as you know, periodic reporting uh, publications are usually very technical and target a very small uh, specialist audience, but this is an opportunity to use the large amount of data which came from you, committee members and state parties, gathered through periodic reporting to show what it actually means to be a World Heritage property in Europe today. The need for this publication was clear from the data of periodic reporting because, as you have seen at the last session of the committee, the general awareness of the convention and its practical implications was rated as poor and singled out as an area in need of urgent attention. <coughs> so, so this uh, publication is exceptional because it's not a technical report on periodic reporting, nor a management manual, which we have already, but it uses got, uh, this data, this very complex data gathered through periodic reporting to present a simple, easy to grasp photograph of the current situation of World Heritage properties in Europe. And in so doing, it fills a gap in the awareness of World Heritage implies for a broader audience. Uh, this book is intended for anyone with an interest in World Heritage and especially those who are not part of the normal World Heritage circles and that includes notably uh, representatives of local authorities um, who may be thinking about preparing World Heritage nominations, 
uh, as the publication covers uh, key facts about the implications of an inscription on the World Heritage List or maybe newly appointed focal points or site managers or heritage professionals looking for good practice examples or strategies for partnerships or support. I'm also happy to report to you that some attention has been paid to gender equality in this new publication with specific gender disaggregated data, uh, etc., and case studies as well. Now, the book is available in English and French. Um, <coughs> Complimentary copies are available today for the World Heritage Committee members, and our UNESCO bookstore has a special discount for all other interested persons at 50% discount, so it's only 12 euros 50. <laughs> uh, both language versions are available for free download from the World Heritage Center's webpage, uh, from the Europe and North America page, which hopefully is coming up on the screen. And this launch of the book is also an opportunity uh, to launch a new hashtag, which is hashtag Our World Heritage, which will be celebrated with an Instagram photo and story competition. As you know, we try to have a new policy to reach out also to the young people. Um, and people around the world are invited to photograph themselves at World Heritage sites and share a story about how they are engaged with it. The winners will receive a UNESCO gift basket. I wonder what's in there. <laughs> as well as a free copy of the publication. And we really hope that this will, this will inspire many people around the world to communicate about World Heritage. And we will feature the entries on the World Heritage website. So I'm very honored, Madam Chair, to share one of the first copies of this book, fresh from the press. It's still warm. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you. This is for you. Thank you. And now you can formally close. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Madame Rosner. It was really a very nice surprise. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the book. Uh, now I would like to close our first orientation session. I would like to thank the Secretariat and the advisory bodies again. And also I would like to thank all the members of the committee, the representative of the members of the committee as well as the state parties. Hope to see you again at the end of May or beginning of June. Uh, thank you very much. I'm closing the session.